And now we're going to talk more about the leading term. How do you know what the leading term is? What is the leading coefficient? What is the degree of the polynomial? OK, so here we go. These are, remember, they're set up to mess you up. So don't let it. Don't jump to the conclusion that because a term is in the front, it's automatically a leading term. It's not. The highest degree term, the highest, uh, the term with the largest exponent is your leading term. So really we should rewrite this as x to the third plus 8x squared minus 5x. Now we can answer all these questions. The leading coefficient, well, the leading coefficient, the leading term is x to the third power. The leading coefficient What is the leading coefficient? I don't see a number there. Maybe it hasn't got one. It does have one. It's positive one. So I am even going to put a plus in front to emphasize that. The degree of the polynomial when it only uses one letter for a variable is the highest exponent, the highest degree of the leading term. The leading term governs what the degree of the whole polynomial is when there's only one letter involved. So our degree, the degree of this is three because the degree of the leading term is three. Now down here, this is definitely the highest degree term. They actually put it in front. So we can say that the leading term, I'm gonna say lead term, is negative one-half x to the fourth. And the leading coefficient is negative one-half. And the degree of the polynomial, the degree of the poly, is four, just like the degree of the leading term. And that's the way it works. This is trickier. Here's the quick way to answer the question. Determine the degree and the leading term of the following polynomial function. Well, you would have to actually do this to know exactly what the polynomial function is. You'd have to multiply x to the fifth minus two times x to the fifth minus two times x squared plus one times x squared plus one times x squared plus one. That'd be a good half hour worth of work. Luckily, you don't have to do that. And I'll show you an example of why. 
if I were going to multiply these two terms together, the first step I would take would be to multiply this x to the fifth times this x to the fifth. That would be x to the fifth times x to the fifth, which since the bases are the same, that's going to be x to the five plus five, which is x to the 10. Meanwhile, and then I, I would go on and multiply and multiply and multiply. Then I would multiply these two terms together first, probably. And my first step would be to multiply x squared times x squared. That would be x squared times x squared, which is x to the two plus two, which is x to the fourth. Whoa-oh! X to the fourth. Then I would do all of my, my multiplying. We're just talking about what is the first term? What is the leading term? All right, so here my leading term is x to the fifth, and then I'll have lots of other stuff, plus or minus. So let's say uh, minus. Minus would be the next thing. And then I would have x to the fourth, plus a bunch of stuff. Let me make that smaller. And then I still have to multiply by that. So I would multiply probably since they're next to each other, x to the fourth times x to the two, or I could multiply x to the fifth times x to the four. Um, it doesn't matter. So if you wanna stay consistent and multiply left to right, you would multiply all of this by all of that. And the first step you would take would be to multiply x to the fifth times x to the fourth, which would be x to the five plus four, which would be x to the ninth. And then there would be plus, minus, whatever, a bunch of stuff. Miss Barbara. Yes. I think instead of the x to the five, it'll be like x to the 10. Yes, it will. And I wrote it right there. Oh, yes, but not down there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so x to the 10 times x to the fourth would be x to the 10 plus four. Which would be x to the 14. And then a lot of other stuff. And I would multiply that x to the 14 times x squared plus one and the first step I would make would be x to the 14th times x to the two, which would be x to the 14, 14 times x to the two, which would be x to the 14 plus two, plus two, which would be x to the 16. Meanwhile, you would have spent a whole lot of time multiplying a whole lot more than just the leading terms, but we're just talking about the leading term. So um, a better way to not waste your whole morning is to do the shortcut part.
and here it is. Here's the shortcut. Thank goodness there is one. Take x to the fifth and raise it to the two power. And then take x to the two and raise it to the third power. Now, when you have a base raised to a power and raised to a power again, you multiply the powers. So this would be x to the 10th times x to the sixth. Now you're multiplying like bases, so you add the exponents. That will be x to the 10 plus 6 which is x to the 16. So you can do it the long way if you want to, but the shortcut is much better. All right, the degree and the leading term. If the leading term, if the very highest degree term is in front where it should be, then it's the leading term. It'll be the leading term anyway, and you wanna be sure to write it the correct way. Um, the degree is gonna be 16. So the degree of the entire polynomial is going to be 16. And the leading term is going to be X to the 16th. And it doesn't ask about the leading coefficient, but what would it be if you don't see a number there? It would be one. So we'll just add that in, the leading coefficient. Is positive one. Notice they're not asking you about, you know, a, another good question to ask would be, okay, since you know what the leading term is, what would the end behavior be? What will it do out at positive infinity? What will the graph do out at positive infinity and negative infinity? Because all of that correlates with the leading term. Okay, pop on in and ask some questions about that if you want. While I get the calculator warmed up, Um, clear, clear that. Um, let me point out to you that the leading term is so important. The leading term determines what the end behavior is. Not only that, the leading term determines what the concavity is. If you've got a parabola. Concavity means is it cupped up or cupped down? That's all determined by the leading term. The leading term is very, very important. Now we're going to go on to another subject because you're going to find another way to do this. Right now, we're just saying use substitution to determine whether two is a zero of the following. Well, here's how you determine if two 
is a zero. F of x, f of two equals two to the third minus 13 times two squared plus 20 times two. I have doubts, but let's see. 20 times two, it is two, isn't it? Yeah, it's positive two, plus five. Let's put this in the calculator. There, want to be able to see what it is. Okay, so, Two carrot three. Okay, and then come down. So hit the right arrow key. Minus thirteen times two squared plus twenty times two. plus five. Now I'm going to hit enter. One. Use substitution to determine whether the number two is a zero of f of x equals x to the third minus 13 x squared plus 20 times two plus five. Well, our answer is no. I'll tell you why in a minute. I expected it to be. Okay. If two were a zero of f of x, then the answer would have been zero. And what you would have found is, what is y when x is 2? Well, that would be 2 comma 0. An x-intercept. But that's not true. Because this equals 1. Now, I want to double check and make sure I hit everything right. 2 to the third minus 13, 2 squared plus 20 times 2 plus 5. And the calculator says the answer is 1. 1 is not 0. So 2 is a very nice number, but it's not a 0 of the function. That's what zeros do. Now let's check the other one. Use substitution to determine whether three is a zero of the function. I sure hope this one is, just so you can see. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I wanna write it out first. F of X equals three to the fourth power minus four times three to the third power 
plus three times three minus nine. Okay, let's see. And I want to make sure. Okay. I want to move this up like that so I can move this up like that. Now, here we go. Uh, since 3 is positive, I don't really need to put it in parentheses, but I'm going to anyway, just so you know. 3 carat 4, come back down, minus 4, parentheses, 3, parentheses, carat 3, come back down, plus three parentheses three minus nine. No, it's not. Well, I want to find us one that is. X to the fourth minus 2X to the third plus 2X squared minus 2X minus 4. And what we're going to put in, what we're going to substitute is 2. So here we go. Is 2 a 0 of f of x? OK, I am going to move this over here. I'm going to view. I'm going to hide the large display and make this big and big. And that's about as big as it'll get. So here we go. Two, tau two is the number we're dealing with. Two carat four, come down, plus, I guess we do need the large viewing window. All right. Two to the fourth minus, uh, Delete. There we go. Two to the fourth minus two times two carat three. Again, I don't need parentheses because two is a positive number. If it were a negative number, I would have to put it in parentheses or the calculator will calculate it wrong. Um, all right, so plus. No, come down first. Plus 2x squared will be 2 times 2 squared. Minus 2x, which would be minus 2 times 2. Minus 2 times 2. Minus 4. So make sure I did this right. 2 to the 4th minus 2 times 2 to the 3rd plus 2 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 minus 4. Okay, now the answer has got to be 0. Ah, thank goodness. Okay, that's what would happen if a number were the zero of a function, you would do these substitutions and you would get the answer zero. 
That's what a zero is. It's a number that you plug into a function and it makes the function equal zero. That's why it's called a zero. Hallelujah. All right. We're going to use grouping. So, well, if you're going to be finding a zero, right, you have to find numbers that you can, that X will equal, that will give you the answer zero, which is why we are going to set this let me make it bigger. There. That's why we're going to set this equal to zero. Now, if you're wondering why I'm putting the plus there, it's because with a plus, that's just the invisible plus sign that's there anyway. But remember, when I have four terms and I'm factoring by grouping, I have to have a plus in the middle. All right, now, both of these terms contain an x squared. How do I know? Because x to the third is x times x times x. x squared is x times x x squared is in both the terms. So that's going to be my greatest common factor. I pull it out to the front, open parentheses and write the leftovers. I will have an x left in the first term, bring down my minus sign and a five. That was easy. Now, what is a little less easy is when your leading coefficient is negative. Because that means the GCF has to be negative. So I need to rewrite this. Miss Barbara? Yes. So is your answer the x squared what? times x minus 5? For the first one, yes. OK, so it's not going to be like a single number we're trying to find for the multiplicities of the zero. Uh, not yet. No. Not yet. OK. Right now I'm worried about this. I have to rewrite this so that I have a negative 1 in this term as well. So. I'm going to have negative one times X plus negative five times negative one. Negative five times negative one is positive five. I can't just cheat and change the number, but I can do this. Now I can take the negative one out to the front as the GCF, negative one times X plus negative five, which is minus five. So I'll bring that over here. Negative one times X minus five equals zero. And that's where I'm at right now. Now, I look at what I've got in totality. These are multiplied, so they're the first term. These are multiplied, so they're the second term. And terms are always separated by plus signs. In both of these terms, I have a parentheses X minus five. That now is my GCF. 
my greatest common factor because it's in both terms at the same time. So I pull it out to the front. And then I write open parentheses. And I write the leftovers. I have an X squared left over. And I have a plus minus five, uh, plus minus one, which is minus one. Okay, now just when you thought you were finished. This is a perfect square minus a perfect square. One squared is one. So I'm going to factor this by the difference of squares. Well, I'll have X minus five times X plus one times X minus one equals zero. Now, I have factored that as completely as I can factor it. I'm going to set each factor equal to zero. You do that when you've got an equation equaling zero. So I will have X minus five equals zero. X plus one equals zero. X minus one equals zero. Oh, 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 minus there. Okay, and then I solve both. Here I add five to both sides. So X equals five. I subtract one from both sides. One minus one is zero. So I have X equals negative one. And then I add one over here to both sides. Negative one plus one is zero. So I'm left with an X on the left and zero plus one is one. And now I have three zeros of the function. I have five, negative one, and one. And they each occur only once, which means the multiplicity of each of these is one. And we can finish writing that out. Five has multiplicity one. Negative one has multiplicity one. And one has, well, has multiplicity one. Multiplicity is how many times you get the same number in an answer when you're solving for zero. Discussion. I'll even write up here, multiplicity, how many times it happens. 
how many times it occurs, that's better. Discussion about this. See, multiplicity looks like a scary word. And it is a scary word, I guess, but it, it has a simple meaning. It would be almost as easy to say and list how many times it occurs. Ms. Barbara, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Why is the X minus five? So it, it was like it was twice. So there, there are like two X minus five, and then you just put one. Um, if X, if you want five to have multiplicity two or three or four, uh, is that what you're asking? No, so like uh, where it says, where there's like, uh, uh, when, where you underlined, it says that you have X minus five, like you have two. Right, I have it here yeah. and here. Yes. Yes. And then wow. you put just one of them. Why, yes. did, why didn't you put like X minus five, uh, like to the square? Very good, here's why. Because if I redistribute this here, and here, I'll have x squared times x minus 5 minus 1 times x minus 5. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's just one thing getting distributed. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good. More questions, more discussion. Anybody? Okay. Find the zeros of the polynomial function and state the multiplicity of each. This is a quartic. This polynomial is called a quartic polynomial. Highest power four. This one here was a cubic, highest power three. Whatever the highest power is, that's how many zeros you're going to have. So I know ahead of time, I'm going to have four answers. Some of them may repeat. I don't know yet. I hope you get to see repeating on these. But we also have to, this is not a, quad, a quadratic, right? So we're going to have to use some other method than factoring or the quadratic formula. Um, well, it so happens that whenever this power is two times that power, there's a method called uh, U substitution. I think I've told you the story that um, it used to be a Greek letter. Let's see how I can. 
Here it is. Looks more like a Y, but that actually is the Greek letter mu. And it's where we get our M from. That might or might not be interesting to you, but we sort of Americanized it and or westernized it and uh, turned it into a U. Here's how you use U substitution. I'm going to take the X squared. And I'm going to let it equal U. U equals X squared. Now notice if I square the U, I have to square the X squared. When I have a base raised to a power and I raise it to a power again, I multiply the powers. X to the fourth. So now we know that X to the fourth will be U squared. And X squared will be U. And I can write this quartic function as a quadratic, since you all know all sorts of ways to factor quadratics. OK. And now we're looking for the zeros. So what I do is I take U squared. Minus 14 U. Plus 45. And I set it equal to zero. And since there's a one in front of the U squared, I can use the easier form of grouping to factor this. All I have to do is factor 45 into two numbers that add up to negative 14. Well, 45 is 9 times 5. But since negative times negative is positive, it also equals negative 9 times negative 5. And negative 9 plus negative 5 is negative 14 which is our B number, the number in the middle. So I'm going to use negative 9 here. And I'm going to use negative 5 here. And then I'm going to solve for you. U minus 9 equals 0. U minus 5 equals 0. Add 9. Add 9. U equals 9. And then I'll add 5 to both sides here. U equals five. Isn't that beautiful? We are now in danger though of getting this problem wrong because we're supposed to be solving for X, not U. U is just the intermediate step. I have to now resubstitute what U equals u equals x squared. So this is, let me continue this on down, x squared 
equals 9 and x squared equals 5. And I am going to have to solve these quadratic equations with something called the square root method. And it's really simple, it's not hard. This is what you do when you solve by the square root method. Okay, take the square root of both sides. And in front of this square root, put a plus minus. Now the square root of x squared is x plus minus the square root of 9 is 3. So now what that plus minus means is this. x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. And now we're going to do the same thing to this. We'll have x squared equals <clears throat> 5. The square root of x squared on both sides with a plus or minus in front of that one, the number. The square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 5 won't break down. So, x equals negative the square root of 5, and x equals positive the square root of 5, and those are my four zeros. So in the answer box, in the blue answer box, you don't have to write them in order. You could if you want to. But let's see, your answer would be negative the square root of five comma, positive the square root of five comma, negative three, positive three. And those are your four answers that a quartic highest degree four problem of uh, uh, equation has to have. We temporarily turned it into higher power two, but then we had to change back. And I did that over here because the method I used is called the square root method. And it's kind of the opposite of solving a quadratic equation. Instead of squaring both sides, you take the square root of both sides. So put that down on your flashcard too. In fact, the best use of the notes that I put up is um, to take them apart and put them onto flashcards and read them once a day. The best way to memorize, the most effortless way to memorize is to read flashcards, a different fact on every card once a day. Do the cards build up? Yes. 
but if you force yourself to do it once a day, and you will have already memorized the earlier stuff when you only had a few cards. Okay, let's see if there's another one of these. Oh, incidentally, look at this. Negative three occurs once, three occurs once, negative the square root of five occurs once, the square root of five occurs once. These all have multiplicity one. I promise you, you will see other multiplicities. Here they are. Okay, we're going to factor this really easily. We've got x to the fourth times x minus four squared times x plus five by itself. And what that is is x times x times x times x times x minus four, oh, equals zero. I'm getting ahead of myself here. x minus four times, times x minus four times x plus five equals zero. Okay, let me double check this. X to the fourth is X times X times X times X. X minus four squared is X minus four times X minus four. And then X plus five is really to the one power there. It occurs once. Okay, now, you know what we do when we've got a bunch of factors, when we have a quadratic or a quartic or a cubic completely factored, we set each factor equal to zero. So I'm going to do that. X minus zero, oh, X equals zero. 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 X minus four equals zero. X minus four equals zero. And X plus five equals zero. Well, these are automatically solved because we only had X's. Over here, I add four to both sides. So X equals zero plus four is four. Over here, well, I'll do the same thing. Plus four, plus four. X equals four. And over here, minus five, minus five. X equals negative five. So our zeros are zero, four, and negative five. Those are the zeros of the function, but zero has multiplicity four. Four occurs twice. So it has multiplicity two and negative five occurs only once. It has multiplicity one. That's kind of a put up job there.
Okay, notice that the degree of this polynomial is going to be, just talking about the leading term now, is going to be x to the fourth times x squared times x to the one, which means we'll have x to the four plus two plus one, which is x to the seventh. So the degree of this, we say DEG, the degree of this is seven, and so four plus two plus one does equal seven individual zeros, even though the zeros occur four times, the four occurs twice, and negative five occurs only once. 